Hello, everyone. My name is JD. I'm going to talk about Kudu, a new storage engine that was released by Cloudera not too long ago. But before I go into who I am, I'd like to know a bit more about who you are. Uh, so quick raise of hand if you're a data analyst. So all day long, you run queries and try to understand data. No data analyst. All right. <laughs> Uh, raise your hand if you're on the data infra infrastructure side, so you're actually like setting up the pipelines, uh, building the systems. All right, not too bad. Raise your hand if you're building databases. Okay. <laughs> uh, and final question, who has heard about Kudu before reading that the meetup was gonna be about Kudu? A few, all right, perfect, perfect. Okay, so yeah. So myself, I'm a software engineer at Cloudera. Uh, I've been working on the Kudu project for two years, but before that I was working on the Apache HBase project for which I've been a commenter since 2008. And before joining Cloudera three years ago, I worked for, during, for three years for StumbleUpon where I was working on HBase doing uh, open source. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so Kudu was closed sourced uh, at Cloudera for two years now, and now we've open sourced the project in September, so we can finally talk about it. This is then my first public talk about Kudu. I can finally go back on the on the meetups uh, on the meetups track, talking about my stuff. So yeah, we're going to talk about Kudu, which we've released uh, in September. This is still a beta product, so everything I tell you about today, if I sound uh, too enthusiastic, uh, I shouldn't be because like we're trying to not oversell uh, and uh, under deliver. Uh, I want you to know that you're not supposed to go download Kudu and then put it in production tonight because you might hit some weird problems. Um, but it is Apache license. It is code that you can download right away. And if you want to provide patches and whatnot, at the end of the talk, I'll show you how. So why, why build Kudu? Why build yet another storage engine in the whole Hadoop ecosystem? Um, so three years ago, Todd Lipcon my coworker and tech lead on the, on the Kudu project, he sat down with our CTO and they had a discussion. What is the, the one use case right now that is not being addressed by the Hadoop ecosystem? So we, we looked at what our customers are doing and what is it they're doing that we could, we could provide a solution that would just like simplify their life. Um, and also, uh, like apart from those use cases, how is the hardware landscape changing so that we can take advantage of it? So if you look at this uh, MBA graph here, so you have, you have access, but you don't have numbers, right? We're just trying to place things on a graph. Uh, if you look at fast random access, you have HBase, which is like all the way on the right. You can do really fast reads, really fast writes, scans, uh, not so much. Writes, if you do bulk loads, yes. But then uh, uh, it doesn't excel as much as Hadoop, whereas Hadoop, you can just directly dump the files and you can use Parquet and do really, really fast scans. So th those two systems are really good at what they're doing, but there's no intersection really uh, where they, one can do what the other does really well. So we need something that's in that red box in the middle that can do both. And unsurprisingly, we came up with a solution here, which is what I'm talking about today, which is Kudu. So we want something that has high throughput for those big scans that you want to run normally, like on Parquet on HDFS. We want something that's low latency enough that you could do whatever you're doing right now on HBase, like you do your random reads, your updates, your deletes of your data, and not be so slow that you wouldn't want to be using it. We want to build a system that people will be familiar with, so it's not yet another interface that you have to learn about uh, that's completely foreign to you, something that feels familiar. So we're going with a relational data model. Uh, we want you to be running SQL queries on top of Kudu. Uh, we want you to be using types. We want you to be using schemas. So a bit about the changing uh, hardware landscape. There are many things that are happening right now. First, we're seeing a lot more SSDs, a lot more flash in, in our machines. The, we used to design system around spinning disks. This is still what you'll see in the data centers, but in five years, it's going to be very different. We also have technology like 3D uh, Crosspoint, which is coming from Intel, which is flash that's a, a thousand times, three orders of magnitude faster than the current flash technology. Now, just imagine having disks that are a thousand times faster than what we have right now. And this is coming from Intel next year, in theory. 
And I'm talking about Intel because they gave us a lot of money last year, right? <laughs> also, RAM is getting cheaper. Not so long ago, 64 gigs was like the high end of what you would see like in your uh, commodity machines. But now a commodity node would be maybe 256 gigs of RAM. And this is just going up. This is not slowing down. RAM is getting cheaper every year. And the JVM starts struggling at those levels. It's rare that you want to start a JVM and like, just go use those 256 gigs of RAM and please don't GC. Uh, so the first takeaway is now that we've removed all those bottlenecks on the I.O. side, CPU will become uh, the, the next bottlenecks. We, like it used to be that we designed systems thinking like we, we have so much CPU on those nodes, like we don't know what to do with them. Can we just put more spindles in those nodes? And now all of a sudden, it's like the I.O. is fast and the CPU becomes a bottleneck because the systems haven't, haven't been designed around that. And the second takeaway is, and that might be a, a, little, a little stretch over what I just said, is that column stores, uh, they're feasible for random access. What this means is you would do a, a row-oriented data store because you will only have to do one seek on your disk and then read whatever you have to read, and that would be the, the whole row, right? And HBase Cassandra sort of worked like that with our column family orientation. You would have like the whole column family sitting next to each other on one disk, and that's one seek. All right, so if you want to do a columnar data store, if you want to read the whole row, that means you've got to seek in each and every of your column in order to, get the, to materialize the row. But if you're on SSDs, if you're running on flash, seeks don't exist. So it's free, almost. So it becomes feasible, not maybe as fast, but feasible. So Kudu, what it offers, it has a SQL-like schema. So you have a, a set of columns uh, that will be typed, that will be fixed, and you have to alter your table, although that is quick, unlike uh, you don't have to log the whole table. But it's, we're, we're getting away from the HBase and Cassandra model of putting as many columns as you want inside one column family. Of those columns, you can say that you have a primary row key. Again, this is nothing new. This is what you've been used to with uh, your relational data stores. They also offer, at the same time, uh, NoSQL-like APIs. So you want to run a scan. You want to run insert, update, delete. This is also APIs that you can find with Kudu. Uh, people that have been working in Kudu uh, come from the rest of the Hadoop, eco Hadoop ecosystem. So we're also, at the same time, offering map reduce bindings, Spark bindings, and Impala bindings, since we're well, from Cloudera. And there's more to come. So, use cases. The kind of use cases that Kudu is going to be really good at. You want a lot of sequential reads. You want analytics. Like, this is what we, we say on the website, and I believe on the back of my T-shirt. This is fast analytics on fast data. So this is like analytics, long reads, sequential, sequential reads. On data that's changing, you're always ingesting data, but also modifying it. So for example, you have a time series. Uh, you're, you have data that you're always ingesting that's coming from a bunch of nodes. And sometimes you have to do modifications. Sometimes you have to do some compactions of your data. So you have to be able to update it. But you're always reading big sequences. Uh, you want to do uh, online reporting. So you have uh, someone that's currently using Impala. And uh, you want to update the data that's Impala. But right now, it would be impossible. Well, with Kudu, you'd be able to do it. And uh, at the same time, that, oh, that's crazy, update your data. So if we look at uh, a typical uh, architecture that you would find today in the wild, let's say fraud detection. So you have incoming data that's coming from your messaging system. And you put an HBase because like, it's random. right? You, you don't want to append to a file, or you could. But in this case, let's say we, uh, we put an HBase, and then eventually, when you have enough data, you dump it all to a parquet file. And you want to use that parquet file uh, when you have enough of them, or maybe right away, eventually, uh, load it into another system. It could be Impala, it could be Hive. You say you want to invalidate some files in Impala, and then say, use these files instead. This is like the new data. This is the updated data. And finally, you can do your reporting on the data that you ingested. So there's a delay here. Right? There's a delay between the time that you're ingesting the data and the time between the time that you're ingesting and between the, uh, and the time that you're actually reporting it. Uh, there's also like what happens if it fails. You have this whole pipeline of things that happen, like your, your set of cron jobs that you have that's running, and then like 
there's some it, there's a bash script that you just modified and it broke and now you have like hours of data your hours of data that behind um, what happens if there's data that like has never been put in that into that uh, that pipeline you have to make sure that every single part of the, the system uh, understands it and can process it without failing so what we're seeing is with kudu you have your data you put in kudu and then you read it you only have one system to operate you don't have this whole crazy set of cron jobs or, jo or joins in the background that you're running. Uh, if you have data that arrives late, let's say you have, uh, you're processing data by day, so you have the, the data for today that's coming in, and then you have the switch at midnight. Now you're, now you're tomorrow or now you're today. You, still, you might still have stragglers that are coming from yesterday, but you've already rolled up the whole day. What happened then? Well, you need to do that, that compaction of your old data, previous data, with what, you, what we close, right? And since it's already in Kudu, uh, you can directly read from your data as soon as it enters. So how it works, uh, I won't go too much into the details, but if you have questions later, I'll be really happy to answer. And by the way, if you have, if you have clarification questions during my talk, uh, I'll take a few if you raise your hand. You have one such occasion right now. Okay, all the way in the back. So on the data type system of tables, um, I didn't see anything like structs or JSON, so you're not, are you supporting a complex bit of type? Or nested type? All Can right. Just repeat the question. Yes. So the question is, what about nested data types? Uh, this is not something that's currently in Kudu, but that's definitely on the world map. We know it's important. There was a question here. Uh, so scan operation, uh, does it work for both HBase and Cassandra? Uh, on your first slide. Uh, HBase and Cassandra scan operations, do they work? Yes, they work. So how uh, do you general, generalize the separation? Because it works in different ways for HBase and Cassandra. Um, how do you differentiate, generalize? Well, so you, let's say you want to just do like a set X star of your table, all right? That would be like a full table scan. That would be exactly the same thing in Impala or HBase. You, you would read from the beginning of each range, tablet, or region, and then through the end, and then return all the data. Or just, let's say you just want column, and then read that all, and then return the data. Like that, that's the, the, the kind of scans we're talking about here. That's one example, right? And what we're seeing is, and I'm going to go a little into that, why Kudu has made some trade-offs that are faster, that make it faster, right? Other things are going to be slower. Now, I'm going to talk about it right now. Yes? Maybe it's jumping forward, but the data, so it's not really designed for fat col uh, columns, right? Like large number of columns. So for time series, you would just add a huge number of rows. All right. So the question is, like, uh, could we were expecting more a taller table than wider tables? Right. Uh, yes, that that would be yes, that would be the case. All right. So the way that you like so. We're using a parlance here that's similar to big tables. So instead of talking of regions or of ranges, we're talking about tables and tablets. So your tablets, they're horizontally partitioned into tablets. Your tables are partitioned to tablets exactly like the, the way you expect it to be like an HBase. So you can do range partitioning. You, it's like you would sort all the rookies, and then you would simply say, like, this is my split point. So the data that falls in between those two bounds will go to that region, well, in that case, that tablet. Or you can do hash partitioning. And you can simply apply a hash function on your row key, and it will be distributed on your cluster. We can support both at the same time in Kudu. We're using RAF consensus in the back end to do the red data replication. Uh, so what this means is you can read from any of the tablet replicas. You don't need to be always bound to go to the, the leader of the quorum. You always write to the leader, but then you, let's say you want to support queries that's like, read five seconds in the past, because I don't, I don't care so much about the, the, the latest updates, you can go to any of the replicas and get your data. And then how we separate those tablets, simply hosted by tablet servers. They are storing the data directly on disk, not using HDFS. And I will stress this out, stress this out, Kudu does not rely on Hadoop at all. You can deploy Kudu without any other dependencies, as long as you have a formatted disk, the XC4 or XFS preferably. The metadata, we're using a, a master slave uh, kind of uh, architecture. So you have a master that holds on the metadata, where the tablets are, where the, what the tables are, where the schema is. But it's pretty light. 
the, the quorums themselves are responsible uh, to report uh, what they are. So the, the master can die, and of course the, the rest of the cluster will continue functioning. It's just that you won't be able to create new tablets, uh, new, new tables. All we did is very small, and we cache it in RAM. So on a big cluster, we did some tests, and we can usually enter all the queries within a few uh, dozens of microseconds, or at the worst case, a few hundred of microseconds. So the master is not a bottleneck. The master is also replicated, uh, but in the public beta that we just released, it's kind of crippled, so single master for a moment. But that, this is not against the design. The master just uses RAF in the background. So when you configure your client, you say this is where the masters are. It's going to figure out which one is the leader, and then bootstrap itself from there. So this, is, this would be your, uh, your typical deployment. You have all the masters on the left. They all have uh, the, what we call the master tablet. One of them is going to be the leader. It's also going to be the master from which you, you obtain the truth. Uh, and then you have a set of tablet servers that all hold some parts of each of the tablets. So let's say um, tablet server one, uh, or tablet server W will be the leader for tablet one. It's going to be also the follower for tablet three. Uh, won't have anything from tablet two. And this is how we do the load balancing also. So a little primer on how RAF consensus work. It's, uh, it's basically Paxos, if you're familiar with that, but mid-simple. So let's say you have a client that needs to write data. So first of all, we'll have to ask the master, where is the leader? And then it will say, well, the leader for, for this, uh, this tablet is on tablet server A. All right. So let's send a write RPC. When the, the, the tablet server receives the write RPC, it's going to write to his write ahead log. And at the same time, in parallel to all the followers, replicate the data. The followers will write the data to their own write ahead, uh, write ahead log. And as soon as you have one of them that replies, that means that you only need two out of three uh, servers to accept the write. Then that means that the leader has achieved majority and can say, success, I have written your data. And we ensure strict serializability on your writes. So fault tolerance. First, transient, transient, transient. Uh, let's say you have a follower failure. So it's not your leader, uh, your leader replica for your tablet that fails. The leader still has majority if you have three. Or if you have five, you can support even more failures than that. So everything fu functions correctly. As long as you restart the tablet server that was holding the follower within, let's say, five minutes, uh, the, the leader will have enough logs to just stream back the follower and uh, get, that, get that node back to the speed to, to where the rest of the cluster is. So you won't even notify it. You won't even notice it. Now, if you have a leader failure, uh, the followers are expecting to hear a heartbeat from their leader. If it doesn't happen three times every one and a half second, they will elect a new leader between themselves. So after, after a few seconds, let's say after 10 seconds, they will, out, they will have a new leader, and you will be able to take inserts right away. There is no logs to replay or nothing like that. There is no session timeout. And let's say that you've restarted the node that was the leader. It's going to join back as a follower, as if nothing happened. It's going to come back, say, hey, guys, I'm the leader. No, you're not. OK. So we can handle uh, n minus 1 over 2 failures. So that means if you have three replicas, we can tolerate one failure. Now, let's say you have a, a permanent failure. There's, there's a node that's just gone. Uh, the leader was going to notice that the follower has been gone for five minutes. It's going to start. It, we'll have to kick him out, because if, even if the follower comes back after five, more, five and a half seconds, um, well, it doesn't have the logs required to get that node back up to speed. So we'll evict the follower, tell the master about it. The master will pick a new replica in the, in the cluster, and the leader will copy the data to that new node. So you, there's a, the bo a bootstrapping process. Just bulk send all the data from that, for that tablet to the new replica. And eventually, when that replica has all the data, you switch mode to follower, starts getting a stream of logs, and, and then it's as if nothing happened. The tablet design, uh, it's similar to LSM, but yet different. So we, the, the, even though we have they're directly on disk and we don't have a, a write once, read many uh, kind of limitation, there are still a lot of good things about immutability. So we don't, we don't try to uh, rewrite the files or change them in place. 
so we have, uh, just like HBase, we have something we call the memorable set that we're going to flush to disk. Uh, durability is guaranteed because we have a write ahead log. Uh, when, you do use, uh, when you do updates, we're going to use MVCC. And then we're going to guarantee that you have a, a, a consistent view of, uh, of your tablets. And we can even guarantee a consistent view across your tablets uh, using the back, something in the background that's called uh, hybrid clock. Uh, could it perform better if you're something that's near current time? So uh, it will always try to optimize to put the latest data as the data that it can reach the fastest. And if you have updates that just came in or you want to go ba back in time, then we'll have to do, to do more operations to get you to what the data looked like at that time. Uh, so the performance as you update your data will worsen. So the Kudu has to do some compactions in the background to get that base data uh, as the data that it doesn't have to apply updates on. So if we compare LSM versus Kudu, uh, Kudu shares uh, some resemblance with LSM, but it, has a, it uses something that's very common uh, in other uh, analytics database. So it uses uh, what we call redo deltas and undo deltas to track the updates. So when it flushed the data that's in the memorable set that, that was inserted in memory, instead of, if you have an update, instead of going into the memorable set, it's going to go to a special in memory store that's called the delta, memo, uh, the delta mem store. And then it will apply the updates and the deletes there, flush them into small files that, are, that contain all the, all, the, all the deltas, and then apply them on top of the data you're reading. Whereas in LSM, when you're reading from, uh, well, you're writing to memory and then you flush. And then you're writing against, let's say you update, the update's gonna go in memory, the same memory set, and then flush into an H file where it's a stable. So when you wanna read from it, it means you have to always merge all those H files, all those SS tables, which is pretty CPU intensive. So the trade-offs. Uh, your random updates uh, will be slower uh, because like the HBase model, the LSM model, does not require reading your data before you write. Uh, there's no primary key constraints. We don't have to make sure that, the, that when you're doing an insert that the data wasn't already inserted. Uh, if you do an update in HBase, you, could, you can update data that doesn't exist because actually there's no update in HBase. You just always write. A delete is also a write. In Kudu, we, all, we, have, we, also have to, we always have to make sure that the key exists before we do anything. So that means you want to write, we got to read. Uh, you want to update, we got to read to make sure that the data exists and find where it is. So you, random updates will be a little slower than a system, say, like HBase. And the single, go, single row reads will also be slower. So it's a columnar design. We're optimized for scans. I want, just want, you want to scan that column for the whole database. Uh, we can do that really quickly. HBase cannot. But if you want to just read one row fully, HBase will answer before Kudu does. Some benchmarks. So we ran TPCH uh, on a 75, uh, 76 node cluster, 12 spinning disks. Using the, the version of Kudu that we released in September in Impala 2.2 with Kudu support. So this is something that's uh, available not within the, the Impala that's currently released. You need a special build that we call Kimpala. So we use a scale factor of 100, so 100 gigs. Uh, it's a small data set that fits in memory. I have a query here. That's the kind of query that TPCH will be running. And here are the numbers. Uh, so we're comparing in blue parquet. So this is Impala querying the data that's stored in Parquet versus Impala that's querying the data stored in Kudu. And so on the x-axis, you have all the different queries that, that, contain, that are contained in TPCH. That you have joins, you have where's, and then you have, uh, you have the latency. So if it's slower, it means it's better. And as you can see, uh, I was saying earlier that we want to be almost as good. Can everyone see correctly? The, the slides are will be available online. Uh, we say we're, we're supposed to be almost as fast as Parquet, but in this, in this test, we were generally faster and sometimes much faster than Parquet. And the reason was um, that there's a lot of things you can do in Kudu that you cannot do in Parquet. If you do predicate pushdown, we don't have to materialize whole rows to then filter them out. So there's a lot of smarts like that we can do. But also the data set fit in memory. So uh, Impala will win if you put that data on disk, but then there's a lot of optimizations that we haven't done yet. And it also, there's a lot of optimizations that Impala hasn't done for data that fits in memory, because usually it doesn't. 
So what about Apache Phoenix? Uh, is there, if there's people from Salesforce here, by any chance? No. Uh, so we compare it on a 10 node cluster. HBase 1.0 with Phoenix 4.3. Uh, a few things. First, loading, loading the data. We do a data load uh, for the line item tables. That's only 6 billion rows in this case because it's a smaller cluster. Uh, the higher you are, the worse it is. So lower is better. And this is a logarithmic, logarithm log scale. So 1, 10, 100, 1,000. Uh, leftmost is Phoenix. So in the load phase, Kudu and Phoenix, so HBase, perform pretty much the same, and Kudu is, uh, Parquet is way faster. If you look at the TPCH query one, so it's a normal query that has a few where clauses, but no joins. Uh, Phoenix did it in 219, whereas uh, Kudu did it in 13 seconds. Quite a difference, more than an order of magnitude. And then Parquet was just below that. Now, just doing a count star, Phoenix actually has to read all the rows to the count, so that's 76 seconds. Kudu did it in 1.7 seconds. That's because we were just reading metadata. There's like a quick optimization you can do here. And well, it's, it doesn't exist there because you don't know what the rules are uh, in HBase. And so the only place that actually Phoenix wins against, uh, against Kudu is if you do a single row lookup. And that's as I said before. So it does it in 40 milliseconds compared to 150 milliseconds for Kudu. And Parquet has to. Like it has a lot of, it doesn't have an index, so it has a lot of data to read to find that one row, so it does in one second, 0.3. And this is, the Kudu is not always winning, and we included this slide just to show you. So we did a NoSQL style of a random access benchmark, which is in this case YCSB. So we use all the workloads that are provided, and uh, we ran it on the same 10 nodes cluster, comparing YCSB on Kudu uh, versus YCSB directly on HBase. Lower is better. Uh, actually, higher is better in this case. So it's throughput, operations per second. You can see the HBase, in this case, inserted way faster than Kudu. Zipfian workloads, like uh, the more rows that, the, the worse the Zipfian, the faster the HBase was compared to Kudu. Uniform, Kudu actually won in one case, and then the other cases, it was more equal. And uh, I don't remember what the D query is, but as you can see, generally, HBase will be faster at these kinds of queries, kinds of workloads. So Kudu is, Kudu is not trying to replace all the workloads. Kudu has a sweet spot in the middle. Uh, and this is what we're trying to demonstrate. Question in the uh, front. Does this test also run out of memory? I mean, does it not use this? Uh, does this test run out so of it's memory? Only 100 million rows. Yeah, it's only 100 million rows. Uh, I believe it's all, it also fit, fits in memory. Is Question it back. In is it reads and writes or is it a mix? Yes, it is a mix. Uh, I think it's just the workloads. It was Todd Lipcon who ran the, the test, but I believe it was just using, like if you look at the workloads folder in YCSB, it's just running those. Yes, question. What about the case when it doesn't fit memory? Because it feels like the secret sauce is actually extremely expensive SSD from Intel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, good question. Like it seems the secret sauce, like uh, what if it does have to hit disk? Uh, I mean, that's, that's really a test that we have to do. Uh, but, like those could rely on special SSDs. We, we haven't seen those special SSDs, uh, the 3D cross point from Intel yet. So. Unfortunately, I can't even tell you. But we'd be faster for sure. I can tell you that because we're optimized for that. Uh, now the question is like, is that does you, do you require that? No, obviously not. But uh, what about the test? Will it still be faster, or will it be slower? And how much slower will it be? Uh, so in the would it be still slower, or faster? Like so in the in the YCSB case, I would fully expect YCSB to be uh, faster on HBase, definitely. Uh, looking at the TPCH results, I would expect. Impala to take over uh, Kudu in most of the cases, except where we can be, like if you have a fairly restrictive where clause and you can do a lot of predicates push down, Parquet would still have to read a lot of data that Kudu would never have to read because we actually know like what we're storing and we have indexes. Uh, and the thing is Impala will do like eight megabyte reads at a time from disk, whereas Kudu will do, uh, I think it's like uh, 64 kilobytes or even four kilobytes. So right there, like there's a lot more round trip between uh, process and disk on Kudu, right? So Impala is going to be way faster. Right, but you would be slower on updates as well. 
Uh, the question would you would be slower for crudo on updates? Yeah. I mean, that, that would be the YCSB uh, uh, workload. But the thing is, uh, we keep most of that stuff. Like, so we use Bloom filters at the, at the row set level. So I, I didn't go into those details. But there's a lot of tricks we, we use like, to, have, to prevent going to disk unless you really have to. And we can use like, really large heaps if we want to. Like give us, all, give us all your memory and we'll use it in Kudu if you want. HBase would be, would have a harder time. Did, did that, uh, are you satisfied with my answer? Yeah. Thank you. All right, let's move forward. So, <laughs> not trust me, I'm a vendor. So, those are slides that were presented at Strata New York uh, when we launched, uh, when we launched a product. So, it was Bing Lin from Xiaomi. Uh, they've been working with us for about a year now uh, on the product. So they're currently using Kudu, not on a uh, really critical path, because obviously Kudu is still uh, in beta. And for them, it was in alpha. And we were regularly breaking the, 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 the RPC, uh, the, the APIs, everything, right? Um, so what they do, uh, they're one of, the, one of the big telcoms, telcos uh, in China fairly recent company. So they have a big data analytics pipeline. So this is what it looked like before Kudu. It's going to be very familiar with the other slide that I showed earlier. So they had a data source uh, running into HBase, running into sequence files, merging that into Hive, MR, Spark. And then you had offline analysis. You had online analysis. Long pipeline. The data could take between an hour and a day uh, to eventually be queryable. Uh, and there is no ordering in there. so. Uh, that, this is the case that we're re referencing earlier where uh, you could have data that's like a day or three days old that comes today. And you might have like all, already closed up that data and now it's coming. So now you have to invalidate some files and then re-upload them. So after Kudu, they have a, a much more simple uh, pipeline where the latency when you get your data and when you can query it is like up to 10 seconds. And they have two, they have like a direct path. If you're, if you're willing to accept back pressure, you can go the fast path. Else you will go the slower path through Kafka and Storm. That could be uh, SQL, uh, that could be Spark streaming. So they did, some, uh, they did some benchmark for their use case number one, which is a mobile service monitoring and tracing tool. So they have all those RPCs that are coming from their phones and, and they're basically doing analytics on that. They have uh, 5 billion records a day and they're growing. There's a lot of people in China, I don't know if you know. Um, so basically, they have, they're doing analytics, but also sometimes they want to reach a single record. So you have this, this mix of workloads that I was talking about earlier that Kudu is really good at. So they did some benchmarks on a small 71 node cluster with the following hardware. So they use one day of data, and then they run a few of their queries. And those are the results. Uh, first, they had to load that one day of data into Kudu and into Parquet. Uh, obviously, Parquet much faster since you, there's a lot less things to do when you're inserting data. You just dump it. And then the query latency. So that means lower is better. Uh, for, so that means for the different queries that we're running, in some cases, uh, Kudu was slower. But in some very restrictive cases, Kudu was way faster. Like the query number six, where in less than a second, Kudu was able to answer with Parquet was taking 16 seconds. And again, this is just because Kudu knows what kind of data it's storing, and it can directly return what you're looking for. So lazy materialization is, is what I'm talking about. Like, we don't materialize the whole thing, and then just to filter it out. First, we're going to apply the, the predicates that we're pushing down into Kudu, and then we're going to materialize the whole row if you really need it. So it's very restrictive, like one out of every 100 million. We're not reading 100 million rows to return only one. We're only returning one. Uh, we can we know how the data is laid out. We have uh, we have the tablets. We know we know where the ranges are. So we if you just read, need a certain range, you only need to uh, contact one or a few tablets that are next to each other. And uh, they're using things that are from the earlier this year. So they're they're still missing a lot of optimization. They're not using hash uh, partitioning in this case. So it could be way even way faster for Kudu. And I'm going to skip that one. All right, so. I'm going to do a little demo. Do I have time? Are you guys bored? No, no? all right. Eight. We're going to do quick, this quickly. So this is a demo that my coworker, uh, Ted Molaska, he's on the East Coast working for Cloudera. 
and he's super, super excited about this technology, like way more than we are. Because uh, he's working with customers and he's feeling the pain every day and he's like, oh my God, this is going to save everything. We're like, whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on. We're not selling the software yet. Like, <laughs> dude. Uh, so he built this little pipeline. He's a gamer, so he's using, uh, he's using data points. So you, like, let's say you have online games that are being played where the, the, the players are winning, and then you want to run some analytics on what the players are doing. So you have, he, first you have a producer. In this case, it's a demo, so it's just producing random data. We're not plugging to Blizzard or whatever. Uh, and it simply sends the data into Kafka. So Kafka is a person queue. And then Spark Streaming in the middle will pull data as it's coming in from into Kafka. And then also merge that data with the data that's in Kudu and run some aggregates that is going to store back into Kudu. And this is all done live. And then from Impala, you can live query the data as it's coming in, as it's being aggregated. Something that you, if, you had, if you only had Parquet, you wouldn't be able to do, right? Because uh, you cannot update the data. Uh, so the code, uh, it's, it's, the, it's, the found, it's the foundation code for all the bindings that we're going to need for data frames, Spark SQL, et cetera. It's all living in his GitHub. The link is there, Spark on Kudu. But if you go to Kudu1214, then you're, this is like the tracking ticket for all the, the work that's going to come in in the actually following weeks. We're a little late on that. So this is where it all stops working. So uh, again, I'm not here to sell software, but I, I use my own software to deploy all the components. So I'm using Hue for the data representation. And we also have Yarn. There you are. Resource manager. All right, so I've run some application before. All right. Can you, I'm going to set this bigger. So the first, uh, the first thing I'm going to run is the Kafka producer generator. So this is simply something that generates the data as if it was the website itself, and then sends, regularly sends the data into Kafka. So I'm doing this live in front of you guys. But sending records now. I know, I know. I'll crash and burn. And if you're familiar with Spark, what I'm doing here is I'm doing a Spark summit of a streaming job. And the C at the end means cluster. So I'm actually using the yarn manager, cluster manager for Spark. And that's so that launch, launches a, a yarn application. All right, there's always a lot of outputting. So this should show up in my yarn applications. So we have, we have the running here. Started at eight. And now we're in Spark, all right. So this is gonna get updated. You have streaming that's always running, so it's always pulling from Kafka. And well, Kudu's already running, so it's already doing the other aggregates. So what if you wanna query it? So you're going to issue, and I'm gonna use Impala. So this is, this is just so that it's nicer to look at, because I could go into an Xterm and then like run the SQL queries in Xterm, but I thought it would be better to do this kind of representation. So let's load the recent queries that I've been running. Set it a little bigger. So I'm going to do a count star. This is just like reading from the, the whole table, just to show that the data really is changing. And then I'm going to do a simple select uh, from gamer, order by last time played. Right? So the, the set of gamers is slowly growing, and they're always playing. And then we want to see the last 10 players that have been playing. So if you click execute, oops, that's not what I want to do. All right, so I have 45,437 gamers. And those would be the latest gamers that have been playing. Now, so let's, let's, remi let's remember gamer ID 5578, all right? So if you execute again, a few more gamers, I believe. And different gamer ID. That's it, we did it, guys. We have dated data in an analytics store. So <laughs> Thank you for those. Of <laughs> All right. But really, what we want to show here is that you can do those fast analytics while you're changing the data 
if you've been feeling the pain of having the Lambda architecture where you're, you have to manage all the updates and the, the changes that are coming in while running your long queries and whatnot, this the Kudu is there for you, and we're trying to solve that problem. And so if I continue querying, let's execute again. There's even more players. Oh my god. And the gamers have changed. Well, this is always happening, so this is going to look very different. Just Spark happening in the background, just Spark happily chugging, just processing all the stuff that it's pulling from Kafka. And Kafka just receiving all the, all the rights from what would be the website, but it's actually something that's uh, fake. And it's just a process running somewhere. So that's my demo. Magic. So the project status. We've released September 28th, so this is still fairly recent, less than a month. Version 0 0.5. Why 0 0.5? Because. Because it's not 0 0.1. Uh, not ready for production. Don't go deploying this. There is no security, so if you're a bank or something like that, you probably right there, that's like a showstopper for you. What we want is feedback. We want, we want, we want to talk to you guys. We want your use cases. Uh, we, want your, we want you to try the software and open Jira's. And if you feel like doing some C++, you can even provide some patches. We have a fairly readable C++ code base. We also have a Java client if you, and a Python client. So if, you, if that's your language of predilection, uh, well, go for it. Our next release that we're planning will be in November. Uh, we didn't have Mac OS X support. Now we'll have Mac OS X support. But don't go deploying a cluster on it. It will only work for a single node deployment. And that's what we think is going to be the case for a long time because of our different requirements. Um, it, won't be, it won't be a big release. It will be just a lot of small fixes. Like We've always been running inside Cloudera plus Xiaomi and a few other. Now that people have been trying it, like they try it in very different ways. There's one guy right now uh, that's been trying uh, the Java client you know, that has never been used before. And he's finding all these bugs that have been fixing. Uh, that's great. That's exactly what we want. And preempting the, that question, when is GA? When is version 1.0? Uh, next year, maybe. I cannot make a commitment, unfortunately. But we will have Kerberos integration, that's for sure, because you, you, we want it for it to be, when we release GA, when we release the 1.0, that's going to be production ready. We need security. We need integration with the rest of the stack. So if you want to get started, as a user, go to getkudu.io. We have a mailing list. We just uh, opened a Slack channel. The, if you follow the link there, you're going to get an invite, and then you can join. The whole team is there, the whole Clara team, and all the new contributors that we're hopefully getting every day. There's a quick start VM that you can download. It already has Kudu and Impala installed on it, so you can just try out the APIs right away. Uh, we have CSDs and parcels. If that doesn't mean anything to you, that's because this is CM specific speak. So if you're using Clara Manager, then you should be pretty happy about that. Uh, if you love working on the uh, databases, uh, this is our GitHub. This is uh, where all the commits go. We're not, we're not like the developing Kudu internally at Cloudera and then shipping things over the wall. We're actually directly uh, contributing the code in the open all the time. Uh, we also have a public Garrett. So this is how we do the code reviews. You just have to uh, send your patch to Garrett, and we're, we'll, be, we'll happily review it. We have a public Jira. It has all the bugs dating back to 2013. So if you want to see all our dirty laundry, and it's the same for all the, the Git, our GitHub logs are all there from all the way back. We have barely scrubbed anything. <laughs> uh, so th this is all there. Uh, Apache 2.0 license. This is real open source. Uh, contributions welcome. And also, uh, it is our intention to donate this to the Apache Software Foundation. This is not something we're doing right away, but this is coming. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, uh, who haven't, I haven't talked to yet. You have, have you asked questions before? Uh, oh, yeah, I'm a professor. All right. Uh, my first class. Yes. Um, so uh, uh, what was the reason behind using Impala to do the query in your demo? I mean, could you have queried Kudu directly? What was the reason to use Impala? Could I have used uh, uh, Kudu directly? Yes. I could have written Java code uh, to query Kudu. It would be less interesting, though. Uh, because Kudu itself is only a storage engine. It doesn't, it doesn't do SQL. It's a bring your own SQL kind of thing. 
So I could have done Spark SQL using the data frames. I could have done MapReduce, would be a little slower. But then we did Impala because that's like the, the one use case that we're trying to solve right now. So it would work. It would work well with Spark SQL. So if you have application today, you know it's possible to get in Spark and you're querying today with Spark SQL. You could just swap out HDFS to do basically. Right. So the question is, you could swap out HDFS. You mean like Parquet basically, right? You would be querying against Parquet if you're doing data frames. Data frames are schema RDDs. If you have a schema, it works well with Kudu, but it works well with Parquet, right? And using Kudu would give you all the qualities over Parquet that I've described before, right? This is not something special to Impala, like this. Like when, I, when we differentiate Kudu with other things, it's really Kudu itself. And those properties would translate, yes. Uh, now the data frame uh, integration, still lacking a bit, we're working on it. So, so don't go, I mean, you know, unless you want to do it, but. Uh, but yes, I could have done it on Spark SQL. Uh, Question? Do you ever plan to have configurable so do, the question is, do we ever plan to have configurable consistency? Uh, we already have it to improve throughput, uh, like you would do like in Cassandra, uh, like you, or Kafka, yeah. Like uh, write and then forget about it. Uh, um, it's a good question. That's, so right now, bulk loading is one of the big things that we're wondering, like how should we do it? Because it's not like other databases where you can just drop the file in HGFS and then tell the database load it, and then it's done. Uh, we're writing against the disk, and the replication is handled by Kudu at a logical level, right? Gets tricky. So uh, I, I don't have a good answer for, for that. But like on the consistency uh, tuning, like you can go against any of the replicas uh, in a tablet co uh, configuration, they call it in, in RAF, right? Uh, let's say you want the very freshest, latest data, you will go against the leader of the quorum. Uh, if you want some data, maybe like a up to last day, you can go against any of the replicas. And I mean, it's going to work. Like it, it will give you the data because it will have it. And if it doesn't have it, you'll wait. Other questions? Frizo. Um, you were talking about a predicate pushdown. What are the predicates that you can push down? OK, uh, the question is, what are, I've talked about predicate pushdown. What are the predicates? For the moment, it would be uh, simple comparisons, like uh, smaller than, equal, greater than. Do you have anything else in mind that we're missing? The, uh, the question is, do we keep, no, we don't keep, we don't keep an index of all the columns, except for the, the row key. So that means we actually have to read the columns themselves. But as I was saying, we have lazy materialization. So let's say you have, you're reading 10 out of 100, and you're like doing a where on only one of them. We'll read that one. If it matches, we read the nine others and bring the whole room memory. Okay. One more question. The question, the other question is, have we done any testing on multi-tenancy? No. But we've done a lot of concurrency testing. But no, we don't, uh, we don't even have, for the moment, things like uh, uh, namespaces. So that would be one thing that we're missing that's very obvious. Although you could manage it at a logical level, like in Bala. I was more talking about um, uh, the, the different types of workloads that are happening. OK, so the okay, fair question. What about the different types of workloads that are running on the same cluster? Uh, well, yes, that's something that we've run, but like, uh, not specifically looking at what the different impacts would be uh, like in between the different use cases. So still a lot of work to do, yes. Other questions? I had seen one. A um, couple of questions. So the Spark uh, connector can read and write. Well, read, obviously, but can it write as well? The Spark connector, can it write? It, obviously, because it, it can read because we have a Kudu RDD. Uh, I think in that demo, it's directly using the client to write. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of, small matter of code, as they say, of small, matters prog prog small matter of programming, small. The second question is, uh, what's the per key metadata overhead? What is the per key metadata overhead? I think it's. I don't remember. I think it's 32 bit. It might might be less than that. Might be way less than that. I don't remember. The thing is, the key we keep a, like an ordinal index. We don't actually repeat the key next to every value like the, like HBase does. Mm. Uh, although that compresses really well, it has other disadvantages. Let's say. Uh, so that's the on this. Is there a per key in memory overhead as well? Is there a per key in memory overhead? Uh, the key. Okay. Not the key repeated itself at Twitch cell. Like an inch base. Okay. 
and you have the key, which is actually an ordinal. And if you don't, if you don't need it, we even we won't even load it. Like we'll just use the ordinal if you have a very long key, for example. But I guess my question was like, what metadata exists in memory? The question: What what, what is the metadata? Any, does anything exist in memory? So when you do a read, like, is it two lookups on disk or? So uh, so what is it that's being loaded? What what is the metadata to create those keys? Right. So we have the we have uh, we have a key index. We have bloom filter, bloom filters for every small chunks of row, rows that we keep. We call them row sets. I, I could go into the details. We have, uh, if you're interested later. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, if you're specifically looking for key comparisons, we have a key index. If you're looking just to like, does this row exist? You have a bunch of bloom file filters that you will have to check. Like, like, is this row in, in this row set? No, no, maybe. Okay, now now I have to read and then actually check the indexes in the files. That's the worst case. Well, it's actually, yeah, the worst case. What do the Sorry. stripes on the back end of Antelope signify? <laughs> so, uh, Kudu is a calendar store, right? So it has vertical stripes. Wait, wait. It's a calendar. <laughs> I know, it's a really bad joke. <laughs> it's, I think it's marketing that thought about that. But if you look at the picture of a Kudu, it's actually what it looks like. Not blue, but it has vertical stripes. <laughs> if it's blue, you've smoked something. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Uh, did you test it on the virtualized environment for, for performance, or do you know if there are any possible problems with running good on Amazon, Amazon, or uh, OpenStack, or any other virtualized environment? Have we done any testing on virtualized environments, and <coughs> have you seen any issues, and do you foresee any issues? That would be the question. Uh, so we've done a lot of testing on EC2, not for performance purposes though. Uh, we've done the testing on Docker. Uh, the thing is the, the interface through Docker to the whole system sometimes is weird, especially for NTP, because we rely on NTP for the, the clock. I didn't, go, I didn't talk about the hybrid clock, but there's this whole uh, mix of logical and uh, physical clock that we're using for the con handling the consistency. Uh, that, that comes from Spanner, basically Spanner they're using an atomic clock but nobody else, nobody else has atomic clocks in their data centers. Maybe you, maybe you do, but we don't. Anyway, so hybrid clocks to the rescue, except it relies on NTP being synced. So there's some weird issues sometimes there. How do you, are you expecting any issues? No, I'm just wondering. Okay. He is not expecting any issues. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take one last question and then we can have discussions uh, with beer and whatnot. All right, you guys were a great crowd. Thank you very much.